Okay, chapter seven looks at testing differences between means. So first, let's start with research hypotheses. With every research, um, the researcher's goal is to test a hypothesis, okay? And usually they're testing a hypothesis about a population mean or a proportion and how they differ between two or more groups. So we're gonna look at how we test hypotheses um, between sample means and proportions in this chapter. So let's start with the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis. So we can never fully prove a research hypothesis, okay? The research hypothesis is saying to us, we have two groups and there is some meaningful difference between them. There is a true difference in their populations, okay? So when there is a true difference, there's a statistically significant difference. Okay, so we're saying that mu1 does not equal mu2, okay? But since we can't actually test for that, because that can never be the case 100% of the time, what we do is we test for the null hypothesis, and we hope to reject that. When we reject the null hypothesis, what we're saying is that the research hypothesis is supported. So the null hypothesis is there is no meaningful difference between the two groups. Any difference that we do observe is a result of sampling error. Okay, so previously we used some information from a random sample to estimate the mean of the population. So remember the sample mean is X bar, gives us the best estimate for mu, which is the population mean. So standard error then allows us to specify a range in which we are confident mu indeed falls. So remember we looked at confidence intervals and we said we would have a mean and then we're 95% confident the mean falls between these two numbers. We can also use a sample then to test some hypotheses about mu. So imagine a police chief claims his average response time for calls for service is five minutes. And he's just basing this on like anecdotal evidence and sort of a guesstimate. We want to test this, so we're going to draw a random sample of 50 calls for which we know the response time. Okay, so the mean of our sample is 5.49 minutes, nearly 30 seconds more than the chief's estimate. Well, is that a real difference or is it due to sampling error? Well, we can test that. So X bar, the actual sample average is 5.49 and S is 1.47. So this allows us to estimate the standard error of the sample mean, okay? And we get 0.21. We're gonna use that to calculate a T ratio that compares the sample mean to the hypothesis mean based on units of standard of error, okay? So our T ratio here is 2.33. The mean we obtained in our sample is 0.49 minutes above or what that T means is it's 0.233 standard error units above the chief's claim. So now we're gonna use table C and we're gonna use that to determine if it's due to chance, okay? So alpha is 0.05, and our, because we always choose 0.05, and degrees of freedom is 49. Remember the degrees of freedom is the number in the sample minus one. Okay, 49 is not available, so we're gonna use a table value of 40 degrees of freedom, okay? So what we're looking for here then is what we call a critical value of T, okay? So the critical value of T for us in this situation is 2.021, okay? So a T ratio larger than 2.021 is less than 5% likely to occur by chance. So there is a real difference here. The chief is understanding the average response time. Okay. So it's rare for us to have in mind a particular value of mu against we're, that we're gonna compare our sample mean against. But where it is more likely is we might have two samples we wanna compare. So what's the average response time for weekday calls versus weekend calls? Is there a real difference? So as I mentioned, we're going to test the null hypothesis. And that's noted as H with a sub zero, okay? HA is the research hypothesis. So the null hypothesis says there's no difference between the means. Okay, here's some sample null hypotheses. Conservatives are no more or less likely than liberals to approve of longer prison sentences. Urban and rural police have the same death rates. So what we're talking about here is we're taking in the first one conservatives and liberals, and we're saying there's no real difference. And in that fourth one, urban and rural police, and there's no real difference. So the null hypothesis explains any differences between those um, 
two averages as due to sampling error, okay? So if we conclude the sampling error is responsible for the difference, we retain the null hypothesis. We're unable to reject the null hypothesis. That means we can't support our research hypothesis. If we can reject the null hypothesis, we accept the research hypothesis, and we say that the difference is too large to be accounted for by sampling error. So urban, urban and rural police do not have the same death rates. Male and female prosecutors do not have the same conviction rate. Okay, so now let's talk about the sampling distribution of differences between means. So differences between means is the calculation, and then we're looking at a distribution of those, a sampling distribution, okay? So this takes a frequency distribution. Remember, we talked about those in the beginning of the semester a step further. So it's a frequency distribution of a large number of differences between sample means that have been randomly drawn from a population. Okay, a sampling distribution of differences should look like a normal curve whose mean is zero. So <clears throat> each score here represents the difference between a sample of 30 males and a sample of 30 females. I'm not going to ask you to draw anything like this, so don't worry about it. Okay, so how do we test hypotheses then with a distribution of differences between means? Before we were looking at raw scores and sample means, but now we're going to make statements of probability about differences of scores. So this can take, this takes the form of a normal curve, and so we can treat it as a probability distribution. Probability decreases as we move further and further from the mean of differences, which is zero. So the further away we get from zero, uh, the less likely something is to occur. <clears throat> okay, so we want to find out how far our difference between means, again, difference between means is a term, okay, lies from a mean difference of zero, okay? So again, that sampling distribution looks like a normal curve, and that's going to allow us to test hypotheses. So we're going to use standard scores here. We're going to go right back to our z-scores, Okay, and our z-score is <clears throat> the mean of sample one minus the mean of sample two over the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of differences between means. So imagine we have a z of plus 0.25, sorry, plus 2.5. This means, what does that mean? Okay, the difference of the means for the two samples, the difference between the two averages falls 2.5 standard deviations from a mean difference of zero. So we're going to use table A and go to column C. And we find that Z equals 2.5 cuts off 0.62% of the area in each tail or 1.24% in total. So rounding off P equals 0.01, that the mean difference occurs by sampling error only once in every 100 mean differences. These are really good odds. We can reject the null hypothesis and we can accept our research hypothesis. Now, another really important concept here is level of significance. <clears throat> this is the level of probability where decisions can be made with confidence, okay? And it's a matter of convention in criminal justice and social sciences that we use an alpha of 0.05, okay? The level of significance here um, is found in the small areas of the tails of a distribution, okay? We're also saying we're willing to accept that, um, any difference might be uh, just due to error five out of 100 times, okay? So those two points then equal plus 1.96 standard deviations from a mean of zero and minus 1.96. So if we get a z-score that exceeds 1.96, it's statistically significant. That should say significant, not signification. Okay, so here's just kind of a drawing of that, right? We see those two 2.5s there. Um, if we're looking at level of significance of 0.01, <clears throat> we can see it's an even smaller amount. So we can get more stringent. We can look at 0.01 or 0.001. So when we do this, though, we risk committing an error. And we can make a type 1 error or a type 2 error. A type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis and say there's a difference, but there isn't really one, Okay. A type 2 error is when we say there's no difference, but we really should be a difference. Now, which type of error you want to make really depends on what you're looking at. So a type 1 error could be worse, for example, 
Say you're saying there's a real gender-based difference in SAT scores, okay? What's worse, saying that there is a true gender difference when there isn't one or claiming there is one when there isn't, okay? So in this case, a type one error because it could be used to justify discriminating against women. So here we might want to select a really small margin of error. If there's even a modest indicator that smoking marijuana impacts SAT performance, we want to get that information out. We might even choose an alpha of 0.10. What's the difference then between P and alpha? <clears throat> P is the exact probability that a null hypothesis is true in light of the sample data, and A is the threshold at which we're considering it significant. Uh, P is determined by the data. So if the P is low, right, remember our P is the exact probability, then the HO, our null hypothesis, must go. So this can be a, a nice way for you to remember that. If the P is low, the HO must go. Okay, so now we want to actually learn how do we test this difference between means. We've got two samples or we've got two groups of people. And we want to figure out if the difference in averages is real. So <clears throat> we're going to start with the standard deviation of the distributions of differences. Okay, so <clears throat> first we want to get the variance from the two samples. <clears throat> S1 squared, that's the variance for sample one, and the one below it is the variance for sample two. Okay, we need those to plug into this formula that's got the blue background. This looks really complicated, um, and if you remind me in class, we'll walk through one. It's just a lot of math, but it's actually not difficult math. Okay, so here we don't know the true population standard deviation, so we're going to use a t-score instead of a z-score. So <clears throat> we're going to assume that population variances are the same for the two groups, okay? <clears throat> and here's, um, here's our formula. Um, if either sample variance is more than twice as large as the other, we should use this formula right here. Okay, this formula doesn't pull the variances. So let's look at this. We're testing... Um, Say we want to test our null hypothesis at alpha equals 0.05, that male and female residents of a particular city have on average the same level of confidence in the local police department. So our research hypothesis is male and female residents differ. Our null hypothesis is that they don't differ. So we're going to sample 35 random males and 35 random females and ask them a series of questions. And here's our results. Okay. Okay. So we want to find the mean for each sample. That works the same way as everything else we've been doing. You can start to see here how everything we've learned in each prior chapter becomes important because each of those steps, we build upon them as we get into new material. Then we want to find the variance for each sample. Then we're going to plug them back into that standard error of the difference between means. Okay, and here we get 0.574. Okay, now we're going to compute the T ratio. Okay, so x bar of sample 1 minus x bar of sample 2 divided by that 0.574 we just calculated. Okay, and the T ratio is 1.394. So now we're going to figure out that critical value for T. Our degrees of freedom is going to be different though. Sample 1 minus sample 2 minus 2. Okay, so our critical value here is 2. Our calculated T does not exceed the table T. We cannot... Let the hoe go. We will retain the null hypothesis. There is not a real difference between men and women. Okay, now there's a couple other ways to look at this. Sometimes we have what's called dependent samples. Um, I measure some, uh, maybe I measure your knowledge about a particular subject material, then I teach you some stuff, and then I give you a, like a pre-post-test kind of thing, okay? The samples are no longer independent. We need to measure them differently, okay? So we're going to do a standard, we're going to calculate a standard deviation of the distribution of before after different scores, okay? So D is the after raw, the after raw score subtracted from the before raw score, and again, N, all these other symbols are the same ones we've been using, okay? And we're going to work our way down again to calculating T, and then we're going to follow the same steps we followed before. So here we're looking at <clears throat> um, how hostile people feel before and after a two-month anger management program. Okay, so here's our program, program participants, uh, their measurement before the program, after the program, the difference, and then you can see we're 
it can be helpful to set up these charts and especially helpful for you to set them up in Excel and let Excel do the math for you using formulas. Um, it makes it a little easier to calculate this data. Okay, we're going to walk our way, walk ourselves through. Um, hopefully you're looking at these in your book. And if you don't have a book, you're looking at them on the slides, these step by steps. It's always good to walk through them and make sure you know how to do them. So find the mean for each point in time. I'm going to find the standard deviation for the difference between time one and time two. Find the standard error of the mean and calculate our T ratio. So here our T ratio is 1.47, right? So now we want to figure out <clears throat> whether or not that surpasses our critical value. So one thing to note here is degrees of freedom is the number of subjects, not the number of scores. So not 12 scores, six subjects minus one. Okay. The T we calculated is 1.47. The T in t the table is 2.571. So we cannot reject the null hypothesis here. We don't see any real difference after the program. Okay, we can also look at matched samples. So say we want to compare homicide rates in states with capital punishment and states without it. Okay, this is a way we can look at... Um, you know, something like death penalty, okay? And you can see we've got matched samples here, right? So similar states paired up. Our null hypothesis is that there's no difference in homicide rates between death penalty and non-death penalty states, and our research hypothesis says there is a difference. So find the mean for both groups, and again, N is the number of matched pairs, not number of scores. I'm going to find the standard deviation, find the standard error, calculate T. So T is 0.878. <clears throat> our degrees of freedom is 6. So our calculated um, T is 0.878. On the table, the one we need is 2.447. So we need to retain our null hypothesis. Again, the hoe cannot go. Okay, we might also do this with proportions, okay? And the logic is very similar, right? We want to see is there a real difference, but what we're doing is a different formula. <clears throat> take note here where it says take the square root of the entire formula. Um, the square root sign is missing from these slides, and I don't have any way to put it in there. So <coughs> criminal justice researcher is interested in the characteristics of people who drive under the influence. So they want to know whether men admit to drunk driving more or less often than women do. They survey 20, 200 males and 200 females. Okay. Um, they basically then say the proportion of men and women who say they have driven under the influence of alcohol is equal. And their research hypothesis is that there is a difference. So and st we've got, you know, 0.45 and 0.32. So we want to compute the two sample proportions and the combined sample proportion. Okay. Then we want to compute the standard error of the difference. So all of this is just plugging numbers into formulas. We want to then translate that into units of standard error, or z-score. And then we want to compare our z-score with the critical value in table A. So we know that the critical value is 1.96. Z here is 2.41. The hoe can go. There is a di real actual difference between these two groups. Okay. We also might do what's called a one-tail test or a two-tail test. Okay. A two-tail test is where our null hypothesis says that there's no real difference and the research hypothesis says there is a difference. A one-tail test is saying that one particular thing is greater the null hypothesis is saying that the first sample is greater than the second sample. The research hypothesis is saying um, that the set first sample is less than the set, less than the second sample. Okay, so we got uh, we're gonna look at a one tail test for dependent samples. Okay, so we're looking at the before and after math scores of a sample of nine remedial students. <clears throat> we compute t the same way we've done it before. Find the mean for before and after the test, find the standard deviation, find the standard error, okay? And then we're going to calculate T, which in this case is minus 3.05. Our degrees of freedom is 8, okay?
Okay, our obtained T is negative 3.05, and on the table it's negative 1.86. So the hoe can go. Okay, the remedial math program has produced a statistically significant improvement in math ability. Okay, what about an independent sample in a one-tail test? A professor teaches criminal law, um, and he wants to determine whether students who graduated from private universities did better than those who graduated from public universities. Okay, so we've got 22 private university graduates, 50 university graduates, public university graduates. Okay, so she calculates her statistics. Right, her null hypothesis is that it is not greater amongst private university students than among published university students. Right, so she's predicting a specific difference here. And that criminal law knowledge is greater among her research hypothesis is that criminal law, the knowledge of criminal law is greater amongst kids who went to a private school. So our samples are 85 and 82, our sample means. We're going to calculate our sa sample standard deviations. There's a lot of S's in this lecture. Calculate the standard error of the difference between means. Calculate a T-score, which in this case is 1.55. Okay? Our degrees of freedom here is 70. It's the two sample sizes minus 2. Okay, so our T is 1.55. On the table, T needs to be 1.671. So the kids who did better in private school... Kids in private who went to private school were not better prepared. Okay, another um, statistical test we might use is called Cohen's D. Okay, this is looking at the magnitude of the differences between two population means. And we're just going to follow this very simple formula here. Suppose a researcher wants to determine whether gender influences the extent to which men and women enjoy reading true crime books. So she asks a thousand people. 530 men, four, sorry, 530 women, 470 men. For women, the average was 4.0 and S1 is 1.83. For men, the average is 3.71 and S2 is 1.71, okay? This gives us a T ratio of 2.12 and that is significant. So we can feel safe concluding that women tend to enjoy reading true crime books more than their male counterpoints. But we don't know how strong of a difference that is. Okay, we can use Cohen's D to figure this out. We're going to take the two sample standard deviations and combine them by calculating the square root of the average of the squared standard deviations. We're just going to plug the numbers we have into these formulas, and S pooled equals 1.77. Cohen's D, we're just going to put the average of group 1 minus the average of group 2, divided by that S pooled, and we get 0.16. Okay, so we want to look at the degree of overlap here. Okay, this can be treated like a Z-score. Um, <clears throat> so D equals 0.16, indicating that the score of the average female falls about 1.6, about one sixth of standard deviation above the average male. Okay. So we know that from looking at table A, column A, 6.36% of scores fall between the mean and Z equals 0.16. Therefore, the mean female enjoyment score exceeds the enjoyment mean score for men by 56 0.36. So we usually look at this as weak, moderate, or strong. And if you look down here towards the bottom, you'll see weak is up to about 0.59, moderate is 0.50 to 0.79, and strong is 0.80 and higher. If D falls below 0.20, it's basically considered, even if it's statistically significant, to not have any substantive meaning. Okay. So we have some requirements for testing between means. We need two means to compare. That means it's interval level data. So remember we've been talking a lot about um, nominal, ordinal, has to be interval level data. Has to be a random sample with a normal distribution and equal variances. And that wraps up chapter seven.